Jesus wants us to adopt a minimalist mentality about our resources. This doesn't mean we fail to properly steward what we have. It doesn't mean that you fail to properly steward what you have in your life or that we fail to properly steward the beautiful 18 acres we have or the ministries we have. This means we're content with needs being met and, and met the Lord's way. And anything beyond that is a matter of reasonable stewardship that best fits where we are and who we have here. Discipleship requires a denial of this world, yet promises great reward. At the end of the day, Jesus and his church and his mission for the sincere disciple, that's enough. And we don't need all the stuff. We decide as disciples that we can be disciples and make disciples with or without the amenities provided to us as 21st century Americans. And we'll steward well, steward those well while we have them, but we don't need them to serve Jesus. We come to Acts chapter 2 and we find the early church putting into practice what Jesus taught. And before we get into this message, the message tonight's titled, How the Early Churches Handled Finances. How the Early Churches Handled Finances. You could say it this way, How the Early Churches Stewarded Resources for the Lord. And I want you to keep a few things in mind as we approach this. One, there are many different opinions in churches and outside of churches on how these matters should be handled. And we're not here to examine them all. But some specific areas of concern might fall under questions like this. Who's in charge? And who makes decisions? Is it an individual? Is it a smaller group of individuals? Is it the congregation at large, is it, a, is it select individuals within the church? Is there someone over the spiritual and there are, are there others over the physical? And what are our roles? Where does the pastor fit in this? What about the deacons? What about old Sally Mae, disciple? What, where does she fit in and her voice? I, I don't mean any disrespect if your name's Sally Mae. That was just a generic name it came up with. But number two, there, there are many different... Is there a Sally Mae in here? Okay, wonderful. Then Sally Mae it is. Number two, there are many different opinions on what the church's resources should go to. And I don't need to chase every one of those down. But with all the opinions, it's our responsibility as a Baptist church. That means we are a church who is guided first and foremost by the scriptures. A Baptist church. It's our responsibility to check our opinions at the door of God's word. Now we can carry them over that threshold. But they're governed by the book. They're governed by the book. And I'm not going to try to prescribe anything to our church tonight. I'm not going to try to make heavy application. You say, oh boy, here we go. Lesson time. Yes, yeah, stay with me now. But we simply want to describe how the early churches handled finances. That's simply what we want to do. Are you in Acts chapter 2? Acts chapter 2, verses 41 through 47. You come upon a church that just grew from 120 people to well over 3,000. I mean, that's explosive. I mean, imagine if that happened here. We would be in a tent out there. Okay. Um, and to be noted, many of the 3,000 were Jews from all over the world. You go back to chapter 2, verse 5, and verses 9 through 11. And so... You see that. And these new disciples came for a feast, Pentecost, and stayed for a church picnic. A long-term one, if you would. Notice verses 45 through 47, or 44, if you would. And all that believed were together and had all things common of necessity. Of necessity. They had to do this. Uh, they had all things common and sold their possessions and goods and parted them to all men as every man had need. And they, continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. They were content to just praise Jesus and love Jesus and be with the church and be in everybody's house every day. And this doesn't mean over 3,000 people were cramming into these houses. They were spread out all over the place, as it was customary there in Jerusalem. And all these people were together, and they pooled their resources to meet daily needs. And most of them had just traveled into Jerusalem, but then stayed long term. And so now they're taking care of each other while in Jerusalem until they see what God wants next. Now head over to Acts chapter 4. Are we understanding what's going on here? This isn't exactly, a, you can't exactly, there are some principles here, but you 
can't exactly cut and paste what happened here to every church. Uh, does that make sense? This is why we can't necessarily prescribe everything here. Okay? We've got to use wisdom and understanding, discernment in the scriptures. But in Acts chapter 4, the church at Jerusalem added another 5,000 plus men, and certainly there were women in addition to that 5,000. They added them in a day, it says in verse 4. And many of them were likely still these devout out-of-towners who heard the gospel, believed it, and were now baptized into the church at Jerusalem, and they had needs too. They had needs too, and it's a good thing their heart was one, okay? Look at verse 32. The multitude of them that believed were of one heart and of one soul, neither said any of them that aught of the things which he possessed was his own, but they had all things common. In verse 34, neither was there any among them that lacked, for as many as were possessors of lands or houses sold them and brought the prices of the things that were sold and laid them down at the apostles' feet and distribution was made unto every man according as he had need. So as the church sought to take care of itself in this hybrid situation, It's mentioned three times in Acts chapter 4 and Acts chapter 5 that those who sacrificed and sold properties and possessions, it's mentioned three times that they brought the money and they laid it at the apostles' feet. It's mentioned three times. The apostles, the gospel preachers, the leaders were overseeing this offering and its distribution to every man according to his need. Do you see that? Okay, maybe we need to go back and hit it again. <laughs> the, the people brought things, laid it at the apostles' feet. These gospel servants made distribution to every man according as he has, as he had need. Is anyone else feeling a little warm in here? All right, could one of our could we get on that? Maybe get some air flowing, and then maybe it'll give us a second wind. A second wind, amen. I'm all for the second wind. The first wind was Pentecost, and the second wind was air conditioning. Hallelujah. The Pentecostals believe the second blessing is the Spirit. We already have the Spirit. The second blessing is AC. Bless the Lord. Or a good breeze under a tree if you're in Africa. Now, when this happened, to be clear, this wasn't communism because it was voluntary. It was voluntary. And this wasn't chaos Because they had apostles ensuring this distribution happened the right way. So think about this. The church by this point could easily have been 10,000 strong. Who thinks the apostles were busy? Yeah, they were busy. They were preaching and praying and ministering and leading and overseeing the honest distribution of these resources. When you're that busy with that many people, some people's needs can slip through the cracks. And that happened. So head over to Acts chapter 6. Acts chapter 6. In Acts chapter 6, some of the widows were being neglected in the daily distribution of these resources. My grandma isn't being taken care of, the Grecian would say. But his grandma, the Jew's grandma, she is being taken care of. So there was some slipping through the, the cracks. Now, I want to point out that distributing these resources was a daily labor-intensive thing for this church of 10,000 people. And we don't quite, again, we don't quite understand what this must have been like in American, we don't quite understand what this could be like in American churches today. So what did the 12 apostles do? Well, if you read, and we've, We've worked through this before, so I won't belabor it, but they came up with a plan that would enable the church to keep moving the gospel forward, and they were not handing the reins of leadership in the church to a subgroup of men. They were simply providing a solution to make sure that the daily duties were not neglected. That's what they were doing. And I will point out this, so... They proposed this plan, number one, they proposed this plan to the church as a whole. That's key. It was to the church as a whole, the multitude of disciples, it says in verse 2 and forward. Number two, the plan pleased the church as a whole. The consent of the governed, help me, 
Yes? Number three, the plan caused the church. The church selected seven men that could carry out the apostles' plan. And the plan was carried out by those men under the oversight of the apostles. So you ask, what were those seven men called? Well, the text doesn't say. It does not say in this text. Yet their role was to perform an appointed daily duty to ensure that God's people moved forward, to ensure that the apostles could keep preaching and praying, and to ensure that widows could keep eating. Amen. Now, that was a responsibility of those seven under the oversight of the leadership, a responsibility that already existed before these men were appointed. Now, head on over to Acts chapter 11. Acts chapter 11. You go up the coast of the Mediterranean Sea a little bit and find the church at Antioch. This was a thriving, multicultural church. May God grant us that. Honestly, I pray for that often. In this area, with all kinds of demographics, we, we, the gospel is a call to all people. We pray that our church, in that, in that sense, will reflect the culture. A multicultural church. This is what the church at Antioch was. It's where the disciples were first called Christians. And something interesting happened. You look in verse 27. And these days came prophets from Jerusalem unto Antioch. And there stood up one of them named Agabus and signified by the Spirit that there should be great dearth throughout the, all the world or, or famine which came to pass in the days of Claudius Caesar. And this famine was one of many instances in the New Testament that we read of that the churches in Judea really struggled to simply survive physically. That would happen and often... The collections that you read of in Paul's letters have to do with this kind of need. You read about the collection of the saints, and I, I'm taking this collection. You read about it in 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, and in other places. This is what he's talking about. In the church at Antioch, they heard about this need, and they, as a church, decided to help. Look at verse 29. Then the disciples, every man according to his ability, determined to send relief unto the brethren which dwell in Judea. They heard about the famine. The famine happened. The church decided we're going to help them out. As, just as we're able, we're going to help them out. We're going to help our brothers. And, and verse 30 says, which they did. They did that. And notice what they did. They sent it to the elders the elders of the churches of Judea, they sent it to those elders by the hands of Barnabas and Saul. So, let's think. Come on, think with me. Who made a financial decision here? The disciples of the church at Antioch. The church made this decision. Do you see that? Who did they send with these resources? The spiritual leaders, the preachers, the apostle Paul and Barnabas. Who did they send the resources to in Jerusalem? Verse 30 says, the elders. Now, more on that in a minute. But turn the page to Acts chapter 12 and look at verse 25. It says, And Barnabas and Saul returned from Jerusalem when they had fulfilled their ministry and took with them John, whose surname was Mark. So Barnabas and Saul were sent to Jerusalem to give this offering to the elders of the churches in Judea. And then it says they returned from Jerusalem when they had fulfilled their ministry. Another word for this is their charge. Okay? So they were sent by the church and they fulfilled the ministry in Jerusalem that the church sent them to do. And then they returned from Jerusalem to the church at Antioch. So this is what you have here. You have the church making a financial decision to meet a serious need. And you have spiritual leaders, teachers, pastors, carrying out that decision by taking those resources to the elders, the spiritual leaders of the churches in Judea. That's what happened. So you say, who were the elders? Well, in Acts 11, this is the first mention in the book of Acts. So who were they? Well, listen to this definition of elders as it's defined in a Christian context. Among the Christians, the elders were those who presided over the assemblies, who presided over the churches. The New Testament uses the term bishop, elders, and presbyters interchangeably. You say, we don't use those terms, Bishop Benjamin. Hey, that sounds kind of cool. But we don't use those terms. You think bishop, you think Catholic church. So who were those guys, the elders? They were the pastors. Pastors. 
They were men who, as the apostles phased off the scene, those men were more and more responsible for the oversight of the churches which the Holy Ghost made them overseers. In fact, go over to Acts chapter 14. Acts 14. After Paul and Barnabas went about doing missionary work and making disciples and baptizing them and organizing them into congregations in the different cities, they went back through to strengthen them. Verse 23. 22 says they were confirming the souls of the disciples, but disciples need leadership. And so verse 22, verse 23, it says when they had ordained them, what? Elders in every church and had prayed with fasting, they commended them to the Lord on whom they believed. So Paul and Barnabas made it a point to appoint such men in every church. And these men were responsible for both the spiritual well-being, as is evident all over the New Testament, here and forward, but also responsible for the physical well-being, the resources, the finances of the churches. And as you study the New Testament, you see that these pastors were held to a high bar of character and conduct as they should, and they were expected to both feed the flock with the Word of God and oversee all aspects of church life. That's what they were called to do. And as time went on, and Paul wrote some letters to certain elders in churches, he also mentioned another office within the church called deacon. And the deacons, as best as I can tell in the New Testament, and by simply going off what the word means, deacons were servants within the church, selected by the church to be appointed by by the elders, the pastors, to serve and carry out duties within the authority and direction of those elders and that church. So what do we have here in the New Testament? You have, number one, okay, here's how they handle finances. You have, number one, Jesus Christ, the head of the church. What he says, his imperatives, what he says goes. What he says goes. Number two, the church Okay, you see this is layered. Number two is the church. The church has his authority on earth. I don't like it when pastors say, my church. Uh Uh-uh. No. God help me. If if you ever hear me say that, I try to correct myself. I know it's verbiage and we communicate. You say, I go to my church is over. I get that. But I try to be very intentional. This is not my church. This is his church. And he's in charge in here. And the fact is that this church has authority. In fact, this church has authority over me. Who voted me in? This church. I didn't come take it by force. This church alone has authority. Overarching authority under Jesus Christ here. This church has the authority to church people. In the, in the process of spiritual of, of church discipline. Who has the final say in church discipline? The church. The church is the authority of Jesus Christ on earth. The buck stops with the church. I said the buck stops with the church. But then you have the pastors. And they are vested with the authority from the church to lead the church the New Testament way and oversee all aspects of her life with vigilance, humility, and hospitality. They're not to be a lover of a filthy lucre but a lover of good men and a lover of hospitality. They were to lead according to the word of God, and as they made decisions, they were to make those decisions according to the consent of the governed, the consent of the church. And then you had the deacons, and these were godly men selected by the church to serve under the leadership of the pastors and carry out needed duties as they arise. It's pretty straightforward. So who was in charge? Jesus. Jesus. And who has his authority on planet earth? Churches do. Individual churches. Emmanuel Baptist Church as a whole, as a whole, has his authority here. What if the church gets away from him? What if the church gets divided? Well, who leads the church's spiritual, physical, proprietal life? The pastor does. And so if the church gets off from the word of God and gets off and, and, and misguided, who is called to preach what Christ, our head, says? The pastor is responsible. He's not called to overlook. He's called to oversee. That is his call. What if a pastor goes rogue? 
Well, let me ask you, who has the authority over him? Who has the authority over the pastor? The church as a whole. This is how they did it. This is the description found in the New Testament, and this is what we strive to follow. Now,